Hello, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, we will wrap the week, break down how the markets have evolved over the last five trading days. Plenty of volatility, plenty of uncertainty, and plenty of movement with stocks accelerating upwards into the close. We had a couple of days this week where we distributed into the close. Thursday and Friday really improving going into uh, the close with Friday finishing the S&P up almost uh, one and two thirds percent. Quite a move. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy red in Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we make sense of these markets together using the charts, focus on the message of the markets, focusing on price evolution, price trend, momentum, breadth, sentiment, all the different parts of the technical toolkit that can help us understand things. And, and certainly, if you're looking for a strong finish to the week, feeling like uh, any downside pressure is uh, a fleeting issue that will not be sustained, you probably got that feeling from the end of the day today as we really accelerated into the close. And I've talked a lot about that last hour and the message there. Earlier in this week and a number of days last week, we had distribution today, very much accumulation with a number of sectors closing up over 2%. Of course, all this is happening as we're prepping for the shows. We're going to do our best to pick out all these different themes and all the patterns. We have great guests coming through the final bar. It's one of my favorite parts are having conversations with some really knowledgeable uh, men and women. Next week, we have David Auerbach on Tuesday the 30th. He's from the Daily REIT Beat, expert in real estate and REITs. On Wednesday the 31st, JC O'Hara from MKM Partners. On Thursday, April 1st, Matt Tuttle uh, from Tuttle Tactical, a founder of ETFs like SPAC and FOMO. Coming up the week after that, we'll be taking next Friday off for, uh, for the Easter holiday. Uh, the week after that, I will be on vacation and we have a series of guest hosts who are going to take us through the week on the final bar. People like Aaron Swenlin, Greg Schnell, Tom Boley, others are going to uh, take a shot uh, running the show and, uh, and hopefully wrap the markets for you as well. I think it'll be a lot of fun to get four different perspectives through the course of the week. So uh, I hope that works for you. I hope you enjoy it. And I look forward to joining you back here on April 12th. We're going to get to our market recap, our, our wrap the week segment in just a moment. But I wanted to start with a poll. We asked you recently on our Stock Charts TV page, also on YouTube and on Twitter, which sector performs the best between now and June 30th, 2021. Four choices, energy, financials, technology, consumer discretionary. What strikes me with the results of the poll, no real clear favorite. All of them got at least 20% vote. So at least one in five of you voted for every single one of these. So it shows you, I think, you know, if you're looking for indecision and no real clear path forward, I think we're getting that. Um, what this could also mean is people are sort of expecting everything to, to work okay. The, the top vote getter, right? The, the most frequent response was technology. And I, I get the argument for that. Um, we're going to start there here in a second, and then we're going to switch to some other uh, to, uh, some other things. But, you know, when you look at the technology sector, when you look at the um, uh, the uh, the Qs or the NASDAQ 100, uh, I have the NASDAQ composite here. It is tempting to think of this as uh, as something that is uh, is sort of finding stabilization, has had a nice rally, has pulled back, it's finding support. It's maybe making a higher low yesterday, and today was the follow through to the upside and uh, the tech-heavy NASDAQ composite pushes uh, to new all-time highs above 14,000 for going to go further on. I totally get that thesis. And, uh, and, and Tom Boley, one of our fellow contributors and SCTV host, does a great job of articulating that thesis, sort of this uh, you know, rounding uh, pattern, the potential for moving, for moving upwards. You know, for me, I'm, I'm, as always, I'm either a bear or I'm a skeptical bull is how I would tend to describe myself. I tend to question uh, markets going higher, especially when you have divergences. And so when things are moving higher on weaker momentum, that concerns me. That's the pattern we saw last month on the NASDAQ, on semiconductors. That's the pattern we've seen now this month with uh, banks and energy companies and all of that. I don't know if we've seen enough of a pullback to justify or to, to unwind, to validate that 
um, that sort of reversal uh, lower. We're going to get to the wrap of the week here in a, sec in a second here, but I did want to spend time looking at one more item, which is the Dow theory, right? Depending on how, uh, you know, again, I, I, I feel like there could be some more uh, backing and filling some more corrective patterns. But having said that, I am seeing so many signs of a healthy market. And I think overall, either I would argue, I think the market long term is going to do just fine. I think the question is, are we accelerating from here? Or are we pulling back and uh, and and building up steam for the next move higher? And Dow theory would tell you that things are just fine, right? The Dow Industrials making a new high today. The Dow Transports making a new high today. On a chart where at the end of the week, both of these have made a new high, that is not the time to be too bearish. That tells you that there are plenty of stocks across the uh, the sectors that are doing well enough to push these two indexes higher. When those things stop going up, or at the very least, when one of them does not confirm, we get a Dow Theory non-confirmation, that's when we want to start getting uh, getting super concerned. Same thing you could say, say about breadth, which we'll talk about in a, in a few moments. Uh, you know, breadth overall holding up uh, holding up pretty well. Let's uh, let's do our wrap the week segment here. We're going to look at just the weekly changes in some of these different assets. And again, a lot of things uh, evolved very quickly at the end. Here's where things sort of settled in. The S and P 500 at the top of the list. That's here. It's here in black. And I didn't get the labels on here, so sorry for that. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through them. The S and P finishing the week now up 1.7. And everything else was below the S and P. So really, owning just the, the the market, right? Owning equities was the uh, was the play at this point. Um, second were bond prices. So stocks and bonds. The S and P and the TLT were the two top performers out of all the things in our uh, asset allocation list. After that, you had the Qs up one percent. You have the dollar up 0.8 percent. That's using the UUP. What uh, was below zero today? What had a negative return this week? Gold down 0.6%. Uh, crude oil prices using the USO also down about 0.6%. Uh, emerging markets down 1.5%. Small caps down 2.6%. Now you can see most of that came Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. You can see Thursday and Friday. Small caps are actually the best of the bunch, if not the very best, uh, one of the top couple. Um, so certainly that was the, uh, that, that was the, the story this week. Um, Bitcoin was actually down here. I took it off that previous chart. It actually, was down seven percent. I think you know the chart of Bitcoin. It looks it, it, you know, in some ways, it's very much a topping pattern where you have this big bearish divergence, similar to what we've seen on a lot of the uh, the equity charts. But jumping up pretty good today. It was down uh, about eleven percent yesterday and came back up to uh, uh, to, uh, to to finish positive today. Very quickly, I just want to check in on where everything else uh, settled in. Small caps led the way higher, really spent most of the day at the uh, the top up 2.4%. The VIX is back below 19 now, which is one of the lowest readings uh, we've had in over a year. Bond price is down about a third of a percent, 10-year yields back up to 166. Gold and silver mixed, so sort of a mix from, from uh, precious metals. Bitcoin today on uh, Friday up over 5%, Ethereum as well, and all the other cryptos that we tend to follow in the green. Very quickly check in at sectors and then we'll go to our Mindful Investor Live chart list. Technology, energy, materials, real estate, all strong today. And technology has not been at the number one seat for quite a while, a very few days I can think of off the top of my head where tech has been number one, but that's what we saw today. On the downside communication services, which is interesting because that's been one of the best sectors up until that's been, you know, one of the better better stories. And uh, my guest yesterday, Doug Bush, was focusing on communication services, finding some decent charts uh, that have some upside. The, the the issue with communication services right now, you have a lot of names that had incredible runs and things like Viacom, Discovery gave back gave back uh, a lot. VIAC in particular was probably one of the worst names anywhere. It was down over thirty percent at one point. Uh, got just below forty dollars a share, back up to forty eight. But that's uh, that's after a, a downgrade and uh, and other things. So overall, really some weakness on some of those entertainment names, which had been really really extended after really uh, you know long established uh, runs. Let's continue on with the Mindful Investor Live chart list. If you've not seen this before, we review it every Friday. We'll get through as many of these as you can. If you want to access this list on your own, go to the Articles tab at the top of Stock Charts. Go to my blog, which is called The Mindful Investor. You'll see at the very uh, link at the very top a, uh, a a link to access this particular chart list. Starting off with the market trend in the S and P. So I update this every Friday after the close. At this moment. You have a similar, uh, you have the same reading that we had last week. Long-term trend is bullish. That turned positive in early June of last year and has remained positive. That seems absolutely right. 
The medium term model still bearish, so still below zero, and that turned negative mid February and has remained negative. So it's interesting that you have a divergence between price making new highs and the uh, and the medium term uh, model being negative. But that's uh, that's what has happened. The short term model has been positive for the last three weeks, indicating a, a short term rally. And, and as I've mentioned in the last couple of weeks, that's about how this market feels to me. I think the long term trend, absolutely, when you're this close to all time highs, it makes sense that it's uh, as positive. The short term model being positive, I get it with the bounce that we've had in the last couple of weeks. The medium term model being negative, I think, indicates the weakness that you've seen with the pullback, right? The, the tactical pullback that you're seeing uh, in, a, in a lot of names and a lot of sectors. What we saw today was a potential resumption of that uptrend. And I think that's going to be the, the story is whether or not if we get a follow through next week or not in a shortened holiday week. The S&P really close to making a new uh, closing high. It actually might have done it. It's really, really close right there. I don't think it quite did. I think we were a little bit higher about a week and a half ago, but very, very close to that 4,000 level for the first time. And that will certainly be a, a milestone to uh, to note. I think I'll be very note I will be very focused on this uh, RSI level. We closed the day around 59. That's very close to what we saw at the most recent S&P peak. The story for me for the last two months is that you've had lower momentum on higher prices, does that change this time? Which would certainly change the configuration of the uh, of the price characteristics and momentum characteristics. Breadth overall has remained positive. I mentioned that earlier when we're looking at the Dow theory chart, that's pretty strong. This uh, breadth chart is also very strong. And again, I, I, I learned a long time ago, never be too bearish when this chart keeps going up. And, and again, it's the S&P at the top, and then it's the cumulative advanced decline lines for four different buckets. And the small cap advanced decline line was probably the weakest of the four, but remained above its 50 day moving average, keeps making new highs and new lows until that stops happening. And it tells you overall the market is in, uh, is in decent shape. You know, looking at the new highs, they've come off quite a bit in the last week. Look at last week with the number of, uh, of 52 week highs. Look this week at the number of 52 week highs. Now this is not updated yet for Friday's close. So this could look a little different going into there, but certainly leading into today, you really didn't have a lot of stocks uh, moving higher. That's after previous weeks where you had you know, a decent number. I mean, this was 15 to 20% of the S&P making a new 52 week high on a, on a given day back here. Down here, it was less than 5%, right? Making a, a new 52 week high. So a healthy bull trend, in my opinion, a healthy bull market making new highs has this uh, number increasing. It's more and more stocks making new highs as well. It shows you that there's broad participation stocks able to eclipse their previous swing highs. We have not seen that yet. That's something I would very much be looking at uh, going into next week. You know, so this is actually bouncing higher a little bit. We saw this uh, last week when we were, we were reviewing, reviewing this chart. This is the percent of S&P stocks above their 200-day moving average, around 90%. We have about 76% of the S&P above its 50-day moving average. Again, this is updated through Thursday's close, so not yet through Friday. But overall, you can see that this is starting to make a, a new swing high. So it's indicating that there are, are plenty of companies, plenty of stocks that are regaining their 50-day moving average. What concerned me back here in February was that you had the, the market going higher, but less and less stocks getting back above their 50-day after pulling back. Now we're actually seeing more and more stocks are able to do that, which is actually a bullish indication. The AAII survey, we talked about sentiment on Thursday's show. So if you missed that, we dug a little deeper into some of these uh, themes, things like the VIX being below 20 and what that means. Things like the AAII survey being over 50% bullish. That is a very fairly rare occurrence. What I'd call euphoric uh, bullish sentiment usually is not a good sign for stocks. However, that's not always the case. And so a spike in bullish sentiment overall just tells me to be on heightened alert for pullbacks and look for signs of uh, euphoria unwinding. And that's what I'd be looking for now. The name exposure index also we touched on uh, yesterday. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, spend any more time on that, but check out Thursday's show if you missed the discussion there. Um, looking at consumer discretionary versus staples, this is one of those times where the two are diverging. So the cap weighted version sloping downwards, the equal weighted version sloping upwards. And what that means is that Amazon and Home Depot, some of the larger consumer discretionary names most likely are struggling relative to others. That's what makes the cap weighted version come down, but the equal weighted version hold up. What's interesting is in consumer staples, I actually saw a number of uh, pretty decent uh, trends, things um, 
Uh, you know, CODCOTY is one of the top ranked uh, large cap names. I think it's number two behind TripAdvisor. Uh, as of the close today, we'll have to see what, what happened as things accelerated to the upside, but a uh, decent chart and that's in consumer staples. So check that sector out if you if you haven't in a while. There's some names that are actually pretty pretty interesting that are starting to work, but the average stock certainly not. Semiconductors relative strength has turned higher and that's actually a, a really good signal if you're, uh, if you're bullish. We saw the, the breakdown below the 50-day moving average for the first time since back here, which was last September, really a negative sign when semiconductors are underperforming in general. Uh, uh, semiconductors do well uh, and the, the economy overall, things are, are doing, doing pretty well. This was a big rotation out of semiconductors about a three week period from mid February down to early March. That so far has now gone back higher. And as of today with a further upside, uh, you're seeing this ratio go high. I'm thinking of charts like uh, AMAT, uh, applied materials uh, in that sector, uh, making new 52 week highs, new all time highs, decent chart, not yet overbought, new relative highs. So there's some good good charts to pay attention to there if, uh, if you miss them. But again, I certainly wanna see the semiconductor uh, ETF continue to improve if I'm gonna feel good about things. Small caps have come off versus large caps. The question I've been, been paced at the end of small cap leadership, I don't think so. I think this is a choppy digestion period that we're in after a lot of small cap names had a lot of really good runs, particularly in financials and, uh, and elsewhere. So we'll see if that comes off. Same thing, equal weighted S&P, came off, but that is breaking out a little bit to the upside as uh, as equal weighted stocks. I'm sorry, as uh, uh, the uh, mid cap part of the S&P is, uh, is doing better. better. Finally, I want to hit on the U.S. versus the world. We have a stronger dollar environment. We'll hit on that chart in a little bit. The U.S. versus ACWI, uh, so the U.S. market versus the entire global markets continuing to go higher. So in general, better to lean away from things like EM overall and into the U.S. is what that ratio is telling me. We need to take a quick, quick commercial break. We'll be back answering your questions in the final bar mailbag. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller, here at StockCharts.com. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets together using the power of data visualization, the power of StockCharts.com. It's great to have you join us every weekday for our show. As a reminder, we'll do another mailbag segment here in a minute. We'd love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment early next week. Shoot us an email, thefinalbar at StockCharts.com, on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV, or on our YouTube channel. Just put a comment below the video that you're watching. We'd love to answer one of your questions in our next mailbag segment on Tuesday's show. Also, as a reminder, the new StockCharts TV on demand is out. It is really well done. I'm super proud of the StockCharts TV team, the quality of the production and the content, and also our great hosts and guests. You can consume all of it as part of a uh, free account. Use your email. Uh, at stockchartstv.com. You can set it up and start watching immediately. We're also on all the app stores. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let's open the final bar mailbag. This is answering questions we've received in the last couple of days from all of our viewers. Thanks again, as always, for sending in your questions. Question number one, when you use the word momentum, what exactly are you referring to? Which indicators would you use to measure momentum? It's a great question. Uh, and it's funny, I was actually debating with uh, with Greg Schnell when we were preparing for our Chart Madness special on Monday. And again, if you missed that, check it out. It was a lot of fun uh, debating the strengths and weaknesses of 16 charts with uh, with my peers. Uh, but we were talking about momentum and just different ways to measure uh, price momentum. Um, you know, for me, uh, my go-to chart, which is the, the chart of applied materials we looked at just before the break, this is my standard chart. And 90% of the time when I'm looking at an equity, this is where I start with. And I learned a long time ago to keep it very simple. So you don't see a lot of stuff on here. It's price, it's moving averages, it's RSI and it's relative strength. And the way I think of it is this, the price is the most important thing. Understanding the trend in the price, it should be the very first question you ever try to answer. Is, the, is this stock, is this chart in an uptrend or downtrend? Until you decide that, you, you have not earned the right to do anything else. After that, the moving averages basically smooth out the noise in the prices. If the 50-day moving average is sloping upwards, the stock is most likely in a pretty decent trend. Where is the price relative to those moving averages uh, is the next uh, set of things I would answer. 
The relative strength is arguably the most important thing on the chart because this shows you how this stock is doing versus other stocks. So I'm looking at applied materials versus the SPY. So if this goes up, the stock is outperforming its benchmark and that in general are the type of stocks that I would want to lean into. The final thing is what I would consider the measure of momentum and that's RSI. So RSI is the relative strength index. It's really telling you price momentum. It's telling you how strong the trends are upwards or downwards. And the way I've usually summarized what RSI is doing is it says over the series of, uh, of, of, of days and weeks, the stock will close up and it will close down. It has up days and down days. And what RSI does is it tells you on an up day, how much higher does it tend to close? And on a down day, how much lower does it tend to go? And this is basically, the RSI is basically a ratio of the average up day versus the average down day over a period of time. Now, the comp, the Calculations are a little more complicated as, as exponential moving averages and stuff to make the data a little more uh, more uh, reasonable. But in the end, that is what it's doing. It's a ratio of it basically tells you how much does the stock tend to move and how much is it moving right now relative to its average movements. Which means if the uh, RSI is overbought, it's extreme upward momentum. If it's oversold, it's extreme downward momentum. So for me, it's all about the way a stock moves from point A to point B over some period of time. And RSI for me is the best way I've found to do it. There are many other indicators that I would bucket in that category of momentum indicators, things like uh, Bollinger Bands and particularly the percent B as a component to that. Um, you could consider MACD or PPO a measure of momentum. Well, it's kind of a trend following device uh, as well, uh, but that's, that's sort of how I would summarize momentum. Next question. I was wondering if you could, if you look at the SPHB versus SPLV, right? So it's high beta versus low vol, which I, I totally glossed over, but it is on my um, mindful investor life. I just passed it. Here we go. High, uh, high beta versus low vol. Let's see the MACD and RSI are flashing warning signs. Can't you still say that we keep making higher highs and higher lows and that until that's no longer the case, high beta is a good place to be. Yeah, so you'll notice when I look at ratios, I rarely do things like RSI and MACD or PPO on, on ratios. It's just not how I've tended to look at it. I tend to look at the individual things using those indicators. The ratios, I just look simply at the ratio because for me, the ratios are about simplifying. It's just understanding how one thing is related to another. Uh, and so I, I feel like I'm able to get the momentum and other things from individual charts. This is just trying to tell me the relationship. And, and overall, I would argue, I agree with you. I think overall, the trend still remains favoring high beta over low vol. Now, this big move you had in high beta, it's a lot of the um, things like financials and others that are in that bucket that, um, that have rallied and done very well uh, going into uh, January and February. So overall, I, I would agree. I think you're still making higher highs and higher lows overall in that ratio. And it tells you to stay away from really the boring stuff. It's the, the riskier stuff over the less riskier stuff. Next question. I, and I, I'm, I'll summarize this answer. I got, I got answers. I, boy, when you share something that, uh, that people have a different opinion on, uh, you guys are willing to share that. I really appreciate it. I've mentioned we don't have a great way to sort of list of stocks by average to range. The answer is we do. And I got that from a number of different people. And as always, I will tell you, I'm, I will, I'll be the first to tell you, I am not a genius at stock, stock charts. I use it every day. I still have a ton to learn. And you guys have taught me something. And thank you for that. So if you go to your dashboard, go down to scans, and I'm picking just a simple scan of the OEX members. So this scan literally has one argument and it says the group is the S&P 100. So I'm basically just saying start with the S&P 100 uh, members and you can literally type in here rank by ATR. Um, let's see, open thingy 14. Uh, you're done. That tests out fine. And we run the scan and I've now sorted the S&P 100 um, by, whoops, how did I not do that right? There we go, sank right by thing, check index. Yep, I think that's good. Maybe parentheses would be better, so we'll do that. We're good. There we go. I've now brought in a column ATR14 and I'm sorting in descending order based on that average true range. So the correct answer is there is a around the side kind of kludgy way to do it, but it can be done. So keep that in mind that you can sort your list by whatever you want. I guess my answer still holds true, which is I would love to give you a much easier way to do what I just did using the scanning engine. And that's what we'll get to with a reporting tool coming someday uh, very soon, hopefully. 
Next question, on the cues, do you see a head and shoulders pattern or an inverse head and shoulders pattern? This is a really, really good question. I love this a lot. This is an active debate I think I'm having with uh, with the Tom Bullies of the world. And again, Tom, it, you know, is, is it a fantastic strategy. He knows charts very, very well and, and is very bullish on growth names, very bullish on technology. And that was a key theme that came out of the uh, chart madness special that I mentioned. Again, you should check that out if you if you miss it on our on demand platform. Um, hearing uh, you know uh, Tom, who's who's very constructive on those spaces, versus someone like Greg Schnell, who is not not overly bearish, is much more constructive on things like energy and materials. Really interesting to hear the strengths and weaknesses of those two points of view. You've illustrated what I think the two cases are. You know, in blue and, and this larger green line, you've illustrated this head and shoulders top. That's my base case, which says we have a, a high surrounded by two lower highs. The neckline is right here. We have broken that when the queues got below around 310 or so. And I think for me, until proven otherwise, that is the, uh, the underlying trend. Now, the other side of it is saying this pullback into the low in March is a little mini head and shoulders with the low there and then two higher lows. We break above that neckline and uh, and it's more about uh, going up from here. I'm very curious as I bring up, um, you know, actually just bring up the cues because that's what you were talking about. It's a decent chart. So for me, here's my chart of the cues. Again, I'm, I'm zoomed out a little bit, but this is the pattern we're talking about. I see the high and two lower highs. I see the breakdown. And for me, that is the underlying trend to pay attention to. I think that measures at least down to the 200 day moving average, if not further. But you're noticing this one, which is the head surrounded by two uh, higher shoulders. The neckline is what's most important. Now, what's consistent between both of those, the cues were up, but not up all the way to break that neckline. That neckline is key. So if the, uh, if the cues can get above that neckline, it would invalidate that head and shoulders top that I've identified and, and indicated as the uh, as the main thing. So either way, I think a break around, uh, above around 325 you know, on the cues, which would put it back above the 50-day moving average, and then at the very you know at the at the the most would you know get above the uh, the the February high. That would certainly negate the head and shoulders top thesis and suggest uh, and suggest uh, further upside there. So overall, I I still see this as a bearish pattern until proven otherwise with the S and P or sorry with the cues getting above those swing highs, that neckline of the shorter term pattern. Really good questions, you guys. And thanks so much for sharing uh, the charts that you're looking at and uh, and what you're running into. Keep them coming. Shoot us an email, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We'd love to hear from you next week. Let's uh, wrap the show, the three and three, three charts, three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is the S&P with the cumulative advanced decline lines. This is a frequent chart that we look at. And again, this is the type of thing that if I printed out charts and had them on my wall all the time, this would probably be the one I would have because what it tells me is if these lines keep going up, if the advanced decline lines keep going higher, don't be that bearish, right? Don't be that negative. What's interesting right now is if you look at what's happened, I think this is updating here as we as we speak for Friday. I think what's going to happen is the S&P is making a new high on the cumulative advanced decline. I'm going to be very key to see if the other cap tiers do the same thing or if you have the S&P making new highs while the others don't. And that's why this is a key chart to watch going into next week. The market moving higher and not being confirmed by the advanced decline lines is very uh, is very key. Chart number two, the dollar index back above its 200 day moving average for the first time since May of 2020. That's how long this has been below its 200 day moving average. Now it didn't just come up there. Year to date, it has been a complete change from a weaker dollar environment to a stronger dollar environment as we made higher highs and higher lows. As long as that trend continues, that will put pressure on non-US markets versus US markets and overall uh, you know, suggest a, a bit of a different feel from what we have last year. That trend and that continuation of a stronger dollar would be a very important uh, sort of pattern to look for. I'm, I'm eyeing this 94.50 to 95 range, which would be the peak from September and also the first Fibonacci retracement level. That might be the upside objective to uh, to watch there. Finally, the chart of China. I mentioned uh, you know some some headwinds for global markets. You can see China and a lot of uh, ETFs, especially in EM, have come off pretty well. The China ETF we're looking at here, the FXI, is back to its 200-day moving average. The last time it was here was back in September, traded below it for one day, closed below it for one day, turned right around and then uh, you know, pounded onto new highs in November, then again in January, again in February. So it'll be interesting to see if we get a repeat of, repeat of that, if we have had the correction on some of these markets, you could have a scenario where some of these global markets actually rally a little bit uh, coming off of extreme uh, you know, weak levels. Maybe the US has a little further to go. 
Um, that's the question I will uh, hope to answer going into next week and beyond. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. As a reminder, check out StockChartsTV.com and our new on-demand platform. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.